Yeah, no. Hello, everyone. My name is Valerie Stearns. Welcome to the webinar, Using Writing to Improve Resiliency and Defeat Stigma. Sorry for the delay. We were having some technical difficulty uh, for our speaker joining us, but she's here now, so we should be all set. Uh, today's session is being recorded. The slides and recording will be sent to all participants within five business days. We do not offer CEUs for this webinar. However, we can provide a certificate upon request. Please use the chat feature to post questions. I have my colleagues from Mental Health Connecticut standing by, Susie Craig and Remy Piak, uh, who will be facilitating those questions at the conclusion of the webinar. When using chat, make sure your message is set to the correct audience panel only or general. Today's presenter is Janet Reynolds. Janet is the lead instructor and creator of Mental Health Connecticut's Write On program. She's an award-winning writer and editor and former high school English teacher. She has created nine magazines, is an award-winning investigative journalist, and is a seasoned publisher, editor, and marketer. In addition, Janet has written extensively about her family's journey with schizophrenia. She holds a master's in English literature from Trinity College and lives in Connecticut with her family. Janet. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. Um, I'm just gonna full disclosure, I'm doing this off my phone. So um, for me, an additional challenge now is I usually gesticulate when I talk and now I'm holding my phone and it's plugged in on a very short cord to make sure that it, um, I don't run out of power. So we're going to start this webinar about using writing and I may write about this when it's all over. Um, at any rate, um, thank you so much for coming. Um, it's and to Mental Health America for um, hosting this and helping Mental Health Connecticut to spread the word about how um, writing can really help people navigate sort of the vagaries and ups and downs of daily life. Um, you'll see on the slide there that here's just sort of an overview of what we're going to be talking about um, in the class. And also um, feel free to sort of put questions or thoughts in the chat while it's happening because um, Susie and Remy can help me um, let me know what things are happening. If people have questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them in between. And then also at the end, we, we'll take some questions too, if you have them. Um, so we're gonna talk about like why write um, and how writing affects the brain. Uh, we're also gonna talk about how writing can be useful in sort of defeating self stigma um, in each of our mental health journeys. Um, and also we're gonna talk about how you could bring one of uh, Mental Health Connecticut's writing programs to you um, and your organization. Uh, I wanna say from the outset that these programs, I think one of the things that COVID has shown us over the, the last year and a half is that um, we're all on a mental health journey. And my hope and dream from this experience, this collective experience is that more organizations will understand that um, seeing to and helping to facilitate everyone's mental health can, can make your organization better, whether or not you are an organization that works directly with people who openly have mental health challenges, or you're just a nonprofit or a college or a school where you will have people who are struggling on any given day and who um, you offering them some other outlets can be something that sort of puts you in another category in terms of employees and people that you work with in terms of colleagues. So with that, we're gonna go into sort of why write. Um, I mean, yes, you flip to the next slide. <laughs> um, this is one of the quotes that I think really sort of sums it up for me about writing. Um, this is from Flannery O'Connor, who is a, a Southern uh, an author, uh, no longer living, but wrote many great books and short stories. And she wrote, I write because I don't know what I think until I read what I say. That's me in a nutshell. And I think that's something that got me going on sort of how I could help show others that they can use writing as well. Um, I'm a lifelong journaler and um, I have many of my journals still. Um, 
and they start in second grade where, you know, I wrote about such pithy things as people who tagged me, you know, out in baseball or um, somebody who, you know, stole a ball from me in basketball or something like that or playing hide and seek. But I've continued to write um, and keep journals at, for most of my life. Um, and I have them in a big box and um, I've written through sort of um, my initial divorce. I wrote through my mother's alcoholism. I wrote through sort of things, celebra celebrating things that happened to me. And they're all sort of chronicled there. And what they do is they provide sort of a little mini history for me of the ways in which I've grown and the challenges that I've faced. But I've also used that writing as a way to sort of better understand whatever it is that I'm going through. And that's sort of what I think what writing can do for anybody. Um, I want to offer this caveat. A lot of people sort of think, oh, I can't write because I'm not a writer, right? And which is just one of these weird things that we have as a culture and a society that, you know, I would love to just kind of erase from people's collective minds, right? Um, nobody says I can't run because I'm not a runner. What they do is they practice running until they become a runner, right? But we have these weird ideas um, around things like art um, or writing where we feel like, well, if we can't already do it, then we can't start it. And one of the things that these programs show is that everyone's a writer, right? Everyone is a writer. Anytime you put words on a page, whether you use it with a pen or a pencil or a crayon or you type, you are writing and it's all valuable and important. Um, we go to the next slide, please. So, you know, one of the things that writing can do is it can help you sort of explore your story. We all have stories about ourselves that we, you know, run on repeat inside our head. I mean, one of the things about families, right, is we all have shared experiences and we can share sort of what those stories are and we can have this sort of collective memory around it. Um, but these are stories we tell ourselves sometimes. Sometimes they're stories that are told to us. Um, and and that we believe. Sometimes their stories are real and sometimes they're not. And by that I mean you can sit around a dinner table and with you know 10 people, your closest family members, and then you know you're discussing and an event happens, etc. And then six years later you all recall that event. And guess what? All 10 of you are going to remember it with a slightly different twist. And that's because we, we, we internalize whatever it is that happens and we then start to play that story out. And if we're constantly told stories in which we are denigrated or put down or told that we're, we're less than in some way, well, we start to incorporate those stories into our lives and then those stories then um, affect how we act moving forward. All right. And so one of the things that these programs are there for are, are to help people sort of look at their stories, decide what's real, um, think about ways that you can rewrite a story. You know, we've all got, we can all, if we take two seconds to think about it, look back on something and go, yeah, oh, wish I had done that differently. Um, or that didn't turn out the way I had hoped. Well, through writing, you can explore that more and you can potentially write that wrong or change that story and change the story that you tell yourself, change the story that you believe from others. So I'm gonna give an example from my own life um, around that. And when I was in um, fifth grade, um, well, in elementary school, every year we would march, march down to the nurse's office as a class and um, get our height and weight done. And when I was in fifth grade, I was, I was a very tall girl. I was the tallest girl in the school in fifth grade. And um, I also was chubby. And I, you know, crossed the 100 pound threshold that year. And um, I was also five foot two. So, you know, not an unreasonable weight if you, if you wanna think about numbers as something that matter. Um, so we would stand in line and each per child would walk up to the um, height, you know, the little height and weight thing. And the um, teacher was sitting at the desk and the nurse would, you know, do your height and then she would do your weight. And when she got to me, for whatever reason, um, instead of just saying my height and weight out loud, which is what she had done for every other child, she 
turned and whispered my weight to the teacher. And of course, kids being kids, right? We were all like 10 years old or 11, whatever. Um, they immediately latched on to that and think, whoa, why are they doing that for Janet, right? That's, she must be, uh, her weight must be something heavy. Her weight must be something that we need to keep a secret. And at that moment, I mean, of course I was mortified, um, but at that moment, a child in the classroom started calling me Janet the planet. And from then on, I was fat. I was fat in my head. I was fat in my heart. I was overweight. I was not ideal. I was not the right body. Now, again, I look back and sort of think, wow, I, you know, maybe I weighed 105 pounds and I was 5'2". I don't know. To me, I look back and think that's a weight a lot of people would think was enviable. But it, for, at the time, it was, it, was, it was not. It was different, right? And so from that point on in my life, that I internalized that and it affected my behaviors around my body, around my own sort of thought process, around um, how I considered myself um, going forward. And, you know, it affected whether I ate, if, did I allow myself to eat three meals? Every time I put food in my mouth at varying various points in my life, I would, you know, self, I would castigate myself internally, like, well, I shouldn't have that M&M, or I shouldn't have this dessert, or I shouldn't have lunch, breakfast, and dinner. I should only eat one meal, right? I, I went through periods of time where I weighed myself every day. Um, and, um, and, you know, if I gained a pound, then that the rest of the day was, you know, ruined, et cetera, et cetera. And this is entirely based on this one thing and based not necessarily on like a reality because because I look I look back um, I'm 66 now and I look back on pictures of me when I was like in my 30s and 40s and I'm like wow I was thin not to me not in my head so I tell you that story because these are the kinds of stories that we tell ourselves, right? Based on something that happens and yet it can impact our lives and how we move forward entirely. And through writing, we have a chance to sort of, you know, change our stories on some levels and change kind of the single story we may tell ourselves. There's a writer, um, uh, Chima John, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who is a fantastic writer, um, from Africa, and I highly recommend her works. Um, but she has a wonderful, wonderful TED Talk, which I also recommend, called The Danger of the Single Story. Um, you might put that in the chat just so people can remember it, um, Remy or Susie. Anyway, just The Danger of the Single Story, TED, TED Talk. But um, in that, she talks about growing up in Africa and how all the books that she read were, uh, were written by, you know, white people. And so she began to have this very convoluted idea about what should be in writing. And then she moved to America or, you know, came to college here, et cetera. And sort of, she taught, she learned about sort of the, the, the very obvious biases that people have around these kinds of things. And what's the danger of the single story? Well, you know, the danger of the single story, I gave you an example of a single story that I lived with that was wrong, right? Um, it can be much larger than that as well. But, you know, you look at the danger of the single story around people with mental health diagnoses, right? What happens in this country? Somebody's shot within 15 minutes, the news is saying, well, he, he or he usually, but, you know, they must be sick. They must have a mental health issue. They must be schizophrenic. All schizophrenics are violent. That's one of the, da that's one of the single stories around schizophrenia. You know, I'm here to tell you that, um, you know, I have a son with schizophrenia and that is not true. But people incorporate these ideas and they start to become part of this whole collective consciousness. So we can rewrite our stories and we can rethink them with some additional thoughts. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit around so your, your brain on writing and how writing affects your brain because that is part of the, the impact, time to change slides, that is part of the impact around um, the work that Write On and our writing programs do. Um, writing, yep, one more. Thank you, okay. So this is from Neuro, uh, Neuro Relay and there's an actual um, you know, link down in the piece itself, which you'll get when you get these, uh, the slides. But writing can serve as a calming meditative tool 
Stream of consciousness writing exercises in particular have been identified as helpful stress coping methods. Keeping a journal or trying out free writing exercises can drastically reduce, reduce your levels of stress. And one of the things that I try to do is, as we start to talk about writing and try to work with people on using writing is to just, there is, this is not a time to edit. This is not a time to judge. This is a time to just let whatever comes out on paper come out. And this is shown through some of these scientific studies, and we'll talk about one that um, occurred with our, our pro program itself in a minute, is that this, this can absolutely change how you think, and, and it can also be calming. If you take away sort of the, um, the little internal you know, voice that's saying, well, that's not the right word, or no, I can't do like do that or whatever, you just set a timer, and then you let your words come out. Don't worry what they are. And you can always burn it at the end if it's something that you're afraid someone else can see. So trying to give students that sort of liberation to be like, this is not a time to, to sort of consider whether or not it's the perfect word or not. This is a time to just let it go, let it go. And that's part of what we work with when we talk to students around this kind of writing process. Um, you know, a lot of people have gone through school and they've been given very restricted ways to write. I mean, when I grew up, it was the five paragraph expository essay, right? The first paragraph had to have an introductory thought with your word and then two or three sentences that line up what you're going to do. And then paragraph two is that's the first idea. And then the second idea is paragraph three and the fourth idea is paragraph five. And then you have your fabulous conclusion, right? It was very, very orchestrated. And if you could like work out that formula, you would get an A. And if that formula was just like too hard for you and weird, well, you didn't do well. And then you started to think, well, I can't write. And that's wrong, right? Because you can get your ideas across however you want. So sometimes when we're working with people around these things, part of what we need to do is meet them where they are and help them recognize that they can let go some of the stories that they've taken inside themselves about whether or not they can write. I mean, there's a process that you know I, I use when I'm teaching, which the six word memoir, which some of you may have heard of, but it's very much focused on like write six words, six words. Anybody can write six words. So I also think it's important to give people a journal to start a class like this because then they have a record of everything they've done. And if they ever think they haven't made progress, they can go back and look at the first couple of pages and recognize what they're doing and sort of see also sort of any themes that might come across or whatever. So it's very much a process. The process itself has therapeutic uh, benefits, okay? On the next slide, we're gonna look at sort of how storytelling can affects the brain. You know, uh, data, things like stats and, and facts, you know, statistics and facts, I mean, if you're asked to memorize that, we can, we can all probably identify for, with moments where we've been asked to memorize a list of something. And it's, and it's hard, right? I mean, some days it goes better than others, right? But if someone tells you a story, you're going to remember what it is, okay? Because you have personalized it on some level. When someone's telling you a story, you're start, you start, incorporate yourself even in an abstract way as you think about it. When I told the story about Janet the Planet, some of you were thinking about, oh yeah, I can identify with that. Others of you are like, well, that wasn't me, but oh, I remember in soccer or whatever, right? I mean, it's a way of sort of bringing community together just by dint of the fact that you're being told a story. I mean, we all love to have stories read to us when we were kids, right? I mean, it starts at something as basic as that. And it's a way to sort of um, uh, join in with someone that, that's different than when it's just a statistical piece of information. And when you hear stories and receive stories, then you can start to think about someone in a different way. Wait, I'm still back on that one. Yep, right. <laughs> So they, this slide, which you'll be able to look at more completely when you receive it, um, it talks about neural coupling where, you know, a story sort of activates a part of the brain that allows the listener to turn the story into their own ideas, right? So that it's a community builder on that level, it becomes more personal, which then if you're in a class situation or a group situation, it, it enables you to share more of your story, right? Mirroring where lis listeners not only... Uh, um, experience similar brain activity, but they also to each other, but also to the speaker. So there starts to be this collective 
um, creation of a space where people can feel more vulnerable but safe at the same time right dopamine is you know literally released when into the system when something is emotional right which stories are more emotional than just a list of math or whatever and then you know the cortex activity so when you're processing the facts it, it talks about sort of how a well-told story can engage many additional areas uh, including the motor cortex the sensory cortex and the frontal cortex all of these things are just literal physical ways in which the brain is is reacting that then affect you mo emotionally you know psychically and potentially spiritually as you're doing this so what we've learned from right on um i want to talk a little bit before we go to the, the next slide i want i'm going to give you this research so our program was studied by the University of Hartford School of Social Research. Um, and um, just to sort of outline how, the, how it was done, they interviewed um, everybody in the class before, they, before the class started, okay? And then they interviewed them at the end of the class, the same questions. Um, and then they interviewed them three months later. So um, there is going to be sort of the class was over but what was the impact and how is it continuing and one of the things that we discovered you know was that um you know people who live with trauma in the past through healing and storytelling and community they can have a new future and new beginning and um you know we all have trauma on some level right i mean sometimes it, you know it's it's fairly minor um and sometimes it's it's substantive and um we have these stories inside ourselves that we are believing and now as we move forward with other people and start to hear their stories and start to write about our stories we start to see the possibility of how our future could be different of how these stories are still part of us but they don't have to dictate who we are we are not more, we are more than one thing, right? Often when I work with um, people who are on a mental health journey, um, they can get labeled as like, you know, I'm a schizophrenic. Well, I have schizophrenia, but I also have blonde hair. I also have a husband, I have a dog, I have three kids, I'm a cellist. I'm not just one thing and yet sometimes people can get labeled into one thing and that starts to dictate who they are so as they sort of explore these stories and see the complexities around them and also see the complexities of the other people with whom they are writing it starts to lead them that, to a place where they can start to believe that they can impact or control their own future and that and that's you know a very liberating thing so that's one of the things on the next slide that really came out in this study that just sort of blew my mind. I mean, the talk, the participants talked of how the program um, in its social support and inclusion made them realize that they're not alone, um, that gave them new perspectives um, around sort of mental health. It gave them under self understanding and the confidence about speaking about living with a mental health um, uh, condition. Many of them for the first time talking about it out loud one of the things that we regularly talk about when we're doing these programs is you know how do you talk about it out in public and um there are many students who aren't you know they don't feel they can talk about it with anybody well you know imagine having something a secret like that and a secret that you know impacts your life on a daily basis potentially and yet you literally can't discuss it with a single person I mean, that's its own challenge right there. Um, so they talked about how this enabled them to sort of feel like they had increasing control and power of owning their story, owning their story. So one of the quotes from here is the interventions targeting self stigmatizing beliefs can potentially break the chain of negative events. The right on workshop is one of these um, interventions was one of the conclusions from the from the report itself. Um, which, you know, was obviously, it was one of those things where seeing it in the, the black and white of a statistical analytical research project really hit home for us and made us realize that we are onto something here and want to spread the word about 
getting people writing. And the next slide, we have a quote from one of the students. Um, Write on gave me the confidence to write without judgment. It taught me how to be a better public speaker and performer. It gave me a beautiful support system and helped me heal old wounds. After years of putting myself down, write on helped me to reconnect with my love of writing. It has helped me to find my voice and for that I will be forever grateful. I will just say that this young woman has gone on from this program a few years ago and as part of what she has done is she's created an entire sort of um, written, spoken word album and performance art piece around her mental health journey. Um, that doesn't mean she hasn't had setbacks, but, she's, but, she, but she continues to move forward in ways that are positive. And this has given her oh, um, incre increased confidence to use this as a vehicle. I also wanna talk about another student who, when we started the class, um, he, he was working at a, a company and we were starting the class. And when we first start the class, I, I asked them to share one sentence that they've written, one sentence. And he was so anxious about this. Um, I talk about this in the preview video in case you didn't see it or did see it, but he was so anxious about it that I had to move, he couldn't speak, he was about to cry. And so we moved on and other people read their sentence and we came back and we came back to him and I asked him, would you like to read your sentence? And he got through his sentence, but his anxiety level was that strong. And at the end, when we had our performance and people read a piece um, and share a piece um, with family and friends of something that they've written for our Telling Tales podcast, he, re he read his piece, it was funny, it was clever, it was, it was insightful. Um, and it was entirely super anxiety producing and he got through it. It was close near the end. He got through it. Uh, he walked over to the side where everybody, his, you know, people in the class are sitting. He, he burst into tears, just the release of having gotten through it. And now this, you know, it's been a couple of years and now this, this young man, he just, um, he when he, he went back to his job he started um speaking openly around this he joined sort of an inclusion um and uh employee group that was working on sort of being a more inclusive uh open working community and he's specifically focused on mental health uh concerns he then left he now has he got his masters in communication and in video and he's making movies he also has spoken and read at other events for us. I mean, he really has just blossomed. And it's not because he doesn't still tr struggle, but he, the, the class sort of became a place of opening for him and enabling him to sort of move to a different place. Okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit about how you can bring one of our programs to your organization. And I just want to reiterate a, about this that um, yes, this is something that can work for um, organizations that are like, you know, Mental Health America and um, other mental health facilities and programs. We are currently doing this program um, through Mental Health Connecticut and the people who are participants and um, clients of Mental Health Connecticut. Um, who are in facilities or in other day programs and things like that, which is separate than the right on thing, which is for young adults who have perhaps um, aged out or they're well enough to, to, to not officially need help and yet they feel very alone. Like they're not hospitalized, um, although I certainly have had students who have been in the hospital in the middle of class, but most of them are working as students. They're working in, um, in jobs, they are doing other things. So they are very functioning and yet they are struggling. And so it can be for people like, like that as well. But we're doing this through Mental Health Connecticut, through people who are sort of more actively engaged as clients, if you will. But you can also do this program in schools and colleges. You can do it, as I mentioned um, initially when I first started um, doing this, um, you can do it at companies right offer this as just a way to sort of explore your daily life and sort of you know add it to your toolbox of things that you do for self-care 
And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I just want to sort of make it clear that it really, we have sort of opportunities for you to be engaged in programs like this in a variety of ways. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, Remy. So it can be done through sort of a live, you know, situation where it's a custom uh, created class with live instruction. It can be via Zoom, um, et cetera. Um, it can be something, and it could be somebody like me. Um, it could be something where um, I also am working on training people within an organization to, to do the program. And we also have created um, a series of six videos called Discovering Your Inner Writer. And these are programs that you could do, people can take on their own. And they're self-guided ways of sort of how to establish your writing practice, what are the ways that you can do that? What are the tips that you have? It includes a facilitator's guide um, and other things. And so I'll, I'll get into that. So yes, Remy, smart. You changed the slide. Excellent. So right on, it's for young adults. And I specifically sort of worked on this with Mental Health Connecticut, this age group, because it's for 18 to 29 year olds who, are, um, who have a diagnosis and consider themselves in recovery because I feel, having gone through this experience with my son, who is um, going to be 34 next week, um, and who was diagnosed a month after his 26th birthday, that once you're out of extremis, there may not be much help for you, or it's very challenging to get help. And I feel like you feel like you're very alone in navigating this. And yet you have a diagnosis, you may be taking medication, you may be doing therapy, you may be doing all the things, but you, but you aren't officially sick enough to be hospitalized or to be in a situation where you would require full-time care or a lot of assisted care. And so it can be very lonely. And so this, I felt like this was a hole in sort of the system um, and, you know, happily, so did Mental Health Connecticut. Um, so that's why Write On, um, which is sort of the umbrella name that we use for all of our writing programs that we're developing, um, is aimed specifically at young adults, 18 to 29. I, I have taught Write On to, I'll call them older adults, um, you know, people who are 30 and older. But I think 18 to 29 is a good cohort. They have a lot of um, similar, um, they can identify with a lot of similar things, both culturally and socially and sort of experientially. And then the older people, 30 and above, I think for the same reasons, but for other, other and have other challenges. They're trying to um, navigate perhaps a work world in a different way, et cetera, et cetera. So the program is nine weeks. Um, I try to keep the class to no more than 15 in one group because I feel like that's a, a good amount to sort of keep everybody feeling comfortable, but also feeling like there's enough going on for people to share and sort of hear other ways of thinking and um, be supportive of each other. It ends with a presentation, as I said, for family and friends. Um, over the course of, of, of time for the class, people start to work on one particular thing that they want to share around the mental health um, journey. And um, people have written about everything from self-harming um, and to getting their initial diagnosis to things that they wish people would do to help and be aware about people who may be having mental health challenges to actual care situations and how the, the, the medical profession and healthcare system may not actually be helping people in the most effective and efficient way. So it's been all kinds of things. And each, it's a two hour class each week. And um, there, you know, we have a very clear way of sort of moving through the, through so that people become more and more comfortable, start to feel more um, at ease with, with their writing and with the class itself. And I also give a lot of, you know, very specific individual direction about someone's writing. So I meet with people individually outside of class to talk to them about their particular writing. You know, some people just want to write poetry, which is fine. Some people want to do other things. Some people, you know, so it's, I, I want to try, I want every student to come out of the class um, feeling 
better about themselves, but also feeling better about their writing and feeling like they have more, um, they've learned something about how to write in a way that means something to them. Um, okay, and then we have also, we just, next slide, did this discovering your inner writer, um, which is six half hour videos that walk you through discovering um, how to set up a writing practice and gives you writing prompts. It also gives you a facilitator's guide, um, which enables people to um, be trained in, in doing it and sort of present it to their participants or to their um, constituents. This is what we're doing right now with Mental Health Connecticut. We are in our um, second session of it um, and it's gone, it's gone quite well. Uh, and I've been working with the facilitators who work, who are Mental Health Connecticut employees. We meet weekly, we do a training beforehand, and then they work with the, with the um, students who have decided to take the class. Um, and so, you know, the audience in this slide, it sort of shows you, if you're in the self-guided sort of student plan, these are people who are just who are curious about writing, maybe they've done some writing themselves already and they sort of already are interested in like it and they want to learn more about it or they want to learn how to incorporate writing in their toolbox. Um, so that's for, that's for them. They will get the six videos and then they also get, um, yeah, that's what they get. And we give them additional information because I think one of the things it's important for people to have is a chance, you know, I don't know what to write. So we're gonna, we give them examples of sort of writing prompts and additional ones beyond sort of what I talk about in the videos themselves. You can also do it where we have um, a variety of things where, you know, you can do it with smaller organizations and incorporate these videos into one group or a class with support from us. And that also includes a facilitator's plan and consultation. I will give you an example. Um, this class, Discovering Your Inner Writer, was used um, in the fall at Westchester Community College um, for um, a social work class. And the professor um, wanted to give the students a, a sense of some tools that they might use down the road when they are social workers. But she also wanted them to experience it firsthand. So what we did was I, did the first class, essentially video one, as a Zoom with the students in the class. She then did the other four, or she did the um, other five um, after that. And I came in at the end and we did the group reading together. And I, I will say that it was, it was really, it, it really went very well. The students really, really liked it a lot and um, they really got a lot out of it. I will, you'll see that in a comment from her at the end. And so then just to sort of reiterate this part here, the plan for larger groups is you can incorporate this into multiple groups or classes and you know, the pricing is sort of here as a general point. I think I, the idea I would like to get across is that Basically, there are lots of ways for us to work this work this out and lots of strategies for um, enabling you and your organizations to take on a program like this with some direction and assistance. You know, the videos can be used as a way, a jumping off point for you to get going. We can train the facilitators just like we're doing at Mental Health Connecticut. I can come in and, you know, sort of do a class. I mean, there, I, there are lots of possibilities for sort of ways to incorporate the program into, into your various um, entities for the people who are watching. Um, so on the next slide, this is just a comment from the professor who used this class, you know, right on exposes students to the value and practice of journaling, both as a therapeutic technique, as well as a personal life skill. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, I, at the last class, um, we had three students who shared their stories um, and she had sort of arranged it ahead of time so we knew who was going to be reading um, since the class was larger, it was like 25 kids and um, all online. And um, they read their stories, which were poignant and, and personal. Um, and then one of the students who had, was afraid to share before, you know, sort of said, I would like to share my story. And of course we said, yes. 
and it was like this great moment because it, it was like everything was coming together. She was inspired to do it. She, she found her, her power place to sort of share the story. And she shared the story about she was um, a woman who was born in Mexico, who was in, is in New York you know, studying and her parents are in Mexico and they both had COVID and she couldn't see them. And she was you know, afraid for them. And just all of these things, these struggles that she was having and she talked about her anxiety and it was just it was it was just so wonderful to sort of see her get to a place where she took another moment of control around her story and around sort of the things that she was wanted to do around this thing that had been so hard and so challenging for her um the other thing i want to say is i did do a faculty workshop at westchester community college about three months after the class was over and that this professor organized because she wanted to show the rest of the faculty sort of how they could use writing during these stressful times, right? Um, to sort of as part of their own self-care. And she invited some of the students to come and speak about the class. And, you know, again, here it was three months later and the students were saying they were still writing. They were still writing and they still found it useful as they were trying to sort of navigate what I think we can all admit is a pretty confusing and sometimes scary world. So that was just, you know, another affirmation ar around it um, that, you know, now obviously not everybody's going to do that, but it's in their bo it's in their toolbox, you know, it can come back, right? Um, and, uh, you know, just like when we all, we exercise and we say, um, I'm gonna go to the gym five days a week, right? And, you know, maybe we do it for a while and then maybe we stop but then maybe we go back because we remember it felt good. And maybe then we keep doing it a little bit more. I mean, we all have those kinds of things, right? It's sort of in human nature on some levels. So um, the students, you know, were still reaping the benefits even after the class itself. So now what I would like to do is I would like to give you a little taste of, of something that we do. So there's going to be three, three minutes of silence. Well, I want to give you three. I want to give you three minutes to try this. So let's do that. And then we'll, I'd rather err on the other side since you've been answering questions. I hope you all have something to write with. I'm going to, we're going to have, I'll do it for two minutes. That way it's not as much time. There it is. Okay. One of the things you can do is it's always a great way to write is just like, how do you feel today? How, how do you feel? I feel I'm going to give you two minutes. Don't think, just write. Okay. In my class, when I do one of these things, I'm like, who was still writing? Because a lot of times people are like, I can't write, but then you know what? The timer goes off and you're still writing because you do have things to say, right? And one of the things about saying this is even if you take a practice and you start your some moment in your day 
and you just write, I feel, and see what happens for three minutes. And then what you have over time is you have maybe 10, 20, 30 of these, and you can look back and sort of see, well, I was really angry all the time, or why was I feeling that way? I mean, it's just a way to sort of beginning to start to explore kind of where you are, and yet it's a simple one to start with. Another one you can do is I am, and then see where it takes you. I am a mother, I am a writer, I'm an editor, I'm a teacher. I am, you know, awesome. I am whatever, right? And see what comes up. Um, or I want is another one. What do you want? What do you really want? You know, it's easy to start an I want list with the top five, right? But when you're in like minute two, the list can get harder to do. But if you let yourself go, you start to get it more inside yourself, right? And you can go back and always look at these things. All right, so the final slide is from Anne Frank. I can shake off everything as I write. My sorrows disappear. My courage is reborn. So I hope I appreciate you spending this time with us today. Um, we are, of course, um, hoping that some of you will be interested in talking to us about how to incorporate writing into the lives of the people that you work with every day on whatever capacity that is. Um, and if there are any questions people want to put into the chat, they can. Um, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, as Janet alluded to, if anyone has any questions, uh, we still have five minutes. So go ahead and post those questions uh, in the chat and we'll be happy to answer them. And thanks again for your patience. Um, we finally got Janet connected. <laughs> yeah, my computer was fighting back. I don't know, anyway. Well, also, I do, I will mention you see the little sort of social media icons down there, but that shows you we do have a Facebook page for our uh, Write On, and we're on Instagram for um, Write On and Mental Health Connecticut, and obviously Mental Health Connecticut is on LinkedIn and all of the above. So there are social ways to meet us as well. It looks like a few folks have asked for a copy of the slides. Um, and Valerie, I think you said a week from today, they'll be available, the recording yes. and the slides. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll send out a notification on that when that recording is available. Okay. And someone asked about becoming involved as a facilitator. Um, so as Janet mentioned, you know, we are building out train the trainer type programs. Um, which we're doing in-house and, and with others. So happy to talk um, with you about what that looks like. It's always best to start fresh and understand a little bit more about your organization, what you're looking for, and then we can we can figure out what you know what way or how to how to shape it that will work best for you. Yeah, I mean when when I talked about it, you know, in in the presentation itself, it was sort of generically there it can be very individualized absolutely and we have just one comment this was excellent because i love writing and already use it for journaling for my mental health patients and clients that's awesome yeah awesome great And I think what I love about, you know, what Janet's created um, with MHC is, you know, there's that journaling that you do for yourself, which I also do and I find really helpful for, for my health, but the community aspect of going through the process of learning how to, you know, find that courage to share a little bit about your story or just get into the, you know, the practice of building those writing skills so you can share your story. The community and the connections, especially with our young adult program that have been forged, you know, really strengthens, um, you know, we saw it so many times, just really strengthens folks' ability to 
to keep going with it, you know, and, and to keep working at it. So. Yeah, actually, Susie, we have a question in the Q&A box uh, from okay. Jenny Sappington. She says, we serve a pretty diverse group of people, age, race, et cetera. Can it be adapted to serve a wider age range? Yeah, I mean, Jenny, you could do it. the only thing we haven't done is we haven't gone younger, you know, so we're 18 and up at this point. Um, but yeah, Jenny, if you want to talk more about that, but we have absolutely created this for all ages above 18. Yes, and I would say that's part of what we're doing right now at Mental right. Health Connecticut with the pro with running the program there. It's a di it's a diverse group, um, and I also think that um, uh, the pot the potential absolutely exists. I probably would give more um, coaching in terms of sort of how to um, how to navigate that. I mean, I've taught high school English for <laughs> six years, um, and um, and then I obviously have been teaching young adults and adults, and um, there are little some little tweaks you need to make, I think, to sort of keep it keep it clean and fresh and sort of um, make it work for everybody. But and also, um, you know, different backgrounds in terms of life experience, et cetera. So the answer is yes, um, and it it could be tailored to sort of think about sort of how to do that the best way for the most success. Okay, well, <clears throat> that does it for time. Um, again, we would like to thank all of the participants who joined us today. Uh, I would like to thank our presenter, Janet Reynolds, as well as Susie Craig and Remy Kayak. Got it. <laughs> Thanks, thank guys. You, and be on the lookout uh, for the recording in one week. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you for joining.